This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Austin Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest, and his name is Mr. Arun Anand. And he is the Chief Executive Officer of the Indra Pasta Vishwa Samwa Kendra. I may not have pronounced it correctly, but I made my, I tried my best. Thank you, Arun, for coming to our show and welcome to our show. And how are you? Happy New Year to you. We're delighted to have you on our show. And Arun, thank you for uh, your leadership. Thank, thank you, you for your thank leadership. Thank you for inviting me. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you, Arun, for your leadership during the tough, turbulent, and challenging times in India. It looks like the India's democratic light is flickering as India is going through political and social unrest and a constitutional crisis. India, to me, has always been a beacon of hope for aspirations, for dream, and for, for democracy around the globe. We are the largest democracy in the world. Your views and values and vision are important to our audience. We meet at an hour of a ch change and challenge. We meet at the hour while India is facing international isolation. We meet at the hour where the fire of discord is burning. We meet at the hour when India is going through some, some time. But let me say this, India's future depends on the foundation of inclusiveness and tolerance. We want India to be unifying nationalism rather than religious nationalism. And I'm proud to be Indian Americans and my story can only happen in America because America has given me the opportunity to succeed is America's inclusiveness and an openness that provided me the opportunity to succeed. These are the values and the strength and qualities of America, that India and all of us can proudly and truly, truly embrace. And all of us are in this together. And together we can help shape a better future for India to make India to be strong, better, tolerant, inclusive. Let us not tear apart the harmonious fabric of India. So Mr. Anand, tell us a little bit about your organization's aims, goals, and objectives. Floor is yours, Arun. Uh, Mr. Islam, uh, first, thank you for inviting me, and I wish a very happy new year to you, your family, friends, and all our viewers. Uh, nice. I think it's a privilege to be here, and uh, I would try to answer all the questions as honestly as I can, but uh, let me begin with the uh, caveat uh, that I'm not the official spokesperson of either the government or the Bharatiya Janata Party, uh, which is uh, heading the ruling coalition. Neither am I official spokesperson of Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh, that is RSS. However, the organization which I head is an RSS affiliated media think tank. It is based in Delhi. It was set up about uh, one and a half decade ago. I have been uh, here uh, looking after uh, the work of this think tank um, for the last about three years. And uh, the work which our organization does is we try to create different communication platforms we try to build up dialogues and put forward a certain viewpoint which uh, the what we call the nationalistic thought uh, supports uh, our belief is that there are two ideas of india and uh, there's one idea which uh, said that India is basically a conglomeration of various uh, sub-nationalities. And the other uh, viewpoint is that no, we are a civilization with uh, certain uh, what you call eternal values and we have been there for the last 5,000 years. So we support this particular viewpoint, the second viewpoint which I have said. And we try to, uh, we try to create communication platforms, build dialogue, convey uh, facts and figures about certain issues. So this is what we do. Very good. So this is the think tank. It's designed to disseminate some of the ideology uh, that you just uh, said very eloquently. And it's a political 
powerful political tool, as we have in America, Broking Institute and many, you know, which is a liberal, which is I'm a mem board member, and also many other organizations uh, in the United States and around the world. So tell us, uh, Arun, uh, how do you sustain this organization? From where do you get your financial support? And do you get any support from the Indian government? I, I would hope that's not the case. Um, uh, Mr. Islam, this organization is run by a trust. And uh, it's uh, purely on voluntary basis. And in fact, uh, I myself work as a volunteer there. And I don't draw any salary, but we do have, of course, professionally paid staff. We do not take any support from the government of India. We also even do not take any financial support from RSS or Bharati Janta Party or any other political party. It's purely on the basis of a contribution made by the citizens who are concerned and who want uh, this kind of organization to be there to, as I said, build uh, you know, the communication matrix. So this is a, so how do you ensure that you're not serving the personal and political interest of your donor? Uh, it's uh, basically, you know, we are actually not taking any money from any of the institutions also. So it's only the contributions come in the form of donations from individuals. And these donations are very small donations. Uh, there is no uh, major, what you call, we don't get a substantial amount of money from any particular individual or any particular donor. So that's how we are able to maintain our freedom and uh, we are able to do what we want to do. Very good. So that's a very well said. Uh, I wanted to uh, have you shed some bright lights. As you know, there has been a lot of protests, not only in India, on many countries about the Citizenship Amendment Act, National Register of Citizens, and internment camp. What is your take on this controversial subject? And how do you tell a 102-year-old person who is a Muslim in Assam that you have to prove that you're a citizen of this country, which I saw somewhere? It may be wrong. Uh, there are a lot of things going on. And why, how, why the religion and politics are mixed together in the United States, the separation of church and states? And then I will talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, uh, foreign minister of uh, India, the ex uh, foreign minister said, and then we can shed some light. Can we have a little bit of discussion on that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Looking forward. Sure. Go ahead. See, first, uh, let me uh, tell you one thing. Uh, as far as I understand the this this whole controversy which has been going around, and we have seen uh, some reports in foreign newspapers also, and of course, a lot of people are concerned Not about some, it. A lot of a lot of uh, international isolation yeah. is there. Yeah. Yeah. No. So even I, the, I would uh, agree. The foreign minister, I think we can agree, even the foreign agree minister, on that. I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I apologize. Go yeah. ahead. No, no. So I think we can agree to disagree on that, that as far as uh, that India is facing a major isolation. But we can come to that later. But first, uh, see, the issue is that what this government is doing, uh, it is not, not doing anything new. For example, if you take CAA, that is Citizenship Amendment Act. So right since the independence, even Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, even Sardar Patel, who was the first Home Minister, and after that, even Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. So all of them have been on record saying that uh, people who are suffering from religious persecution in our three neighboring countries, so they should be granted the uh, status of citizens here. So what this, but you no, know, Unfortunately, what has happened over the last 70 years or 70 odd years, as ever since India got independence, we became a very status quoist society. And the, there were governments who were coming, they were not paying, uh, they, they were only paying lip, lip service. They were not actually translating their manifestos into government policies. Now, when BJP got elected in 2019, so all these issues are already there in the party's manifesto. It has got the mandate to do that. And uh, it's ironical that when a party, political party in India now starts implementing its manifesto, so then questions are raised about the credibility or the intentions of the government. 
so i would say people are getting a little some people are getting a little unnerved about it because these these two uh, leaders amit shah who is the home minister and prime minister narendra modi so they are trying to break the status quo that is why you see a series of decisions on that one second is that when you said about the 102 year old uh, gentleman in assam who will have to produce the papers now as far as nrc is concerned see it's not that this government uh has done it on its own it is on the directives of the supreme court and uh, that this nrc thing has been implemented so whatever this government has done it is on the directives of the supreme court and the supreme court has given this directives because the uh, in 1980s uh, the then prime minister rajiv gandhi who was heading a congress government not a bjp government he had signed a assam accord uh with the agitating uh, organizations there so to implement the assam accord nrc had to be set up it was part of the accord and when it was not being done then supreme court directed the government to do it so this is the situation okay so thank you for your history lessons <laughs> past is a history not a destiny correct and if the us government decides to say today that we do not want to welcome anyone except christians no hindus no muslims would you take them as a as a people which is 4 million wonderful indian americans to india because they they will be religiously prosecuted what about the fact that the ahmadiyya muslims and shia in pakistan are discriminated face hostility and prejudice and discrimination what about the catholic in ireland what about the palestinians in israel and what about in burma and what about the muslims in in the in the china so we do not want to become a, a, a we do not uh, so we do uh, as i understand that we do not want to become a guardian a protector of the hindu faith around the globe so let me quote what he said and i do not know him i never met him i'm sure and i am not in india i left india when i was 10 years old that was 50 years ago Mr Shiv Shankar Menon I think he was a foreign minister or foreign secretary Arun foreign secretary he was a foreign secretary. yeah he said india is violating the article 21 of the international covenant on its civic and political rights by passing the citizenship amendment act and he is saying that india is in violations of the international commitment he also said that india just like the pakistan has become now which is a religiously driven and intolerant country and which is what uh, the power to be said the same thing uh, they always try to divide the people based on the you know but we do not india has always a secular country and we want we take a pride in india what india has been able to accomplish and i love india just like you do we want india to prosper to have upper mobility to bring the people together but the fact of the matter is we do not want to be like pakistan and nobody should be right so let me change a little bit uh, our conversation and thank you very much for all you uh, you have said and and that's your views and your vision and and uh, and that's what is that's what makes a creates a common cause in a democracy that's how democracy flourishes and india towers itself as the largest democracy in the world and we can talk about whether there's a freedom of press and freedom of expression and the respect for human rights in a, some other times <laughs> but let me tell, let me say that uh, why has there been so much protest across india especially by the student community and i just read an article in new york times the violent backlash from up police has been the most deadly and troubling and alarming police and up are accused of abusing muslims and basically they're taking over their property with a right or wrong i do not know i'm sure you will agree that protest is a sign of india's democracy and democratic values as you know the india is facing largest unemployment rate india should be concentrating on bringing the bringing the people together creating a job attracting the foreign investment giving a hope to our younger generations and they are the hope of tomorrow 
And this protest is fueled by frustrations, and sometimes a lot of people feel hatred and bigotry. Your comment, Arun. <clears throat> That's what the newspaper says. Yes. Uh, see, first, uh, let me talk about uh, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon. Uh, see, he has already been, uh, by as far as I know, uh, he has already taken political sides. He has been supporting a particular political party, which is Congress, which is in opposition. So I wouldn't take his comment uh, beyond a point in on face value. It's more of a political uh, statement which he has made. Uh, but of course, he has every right to make that statement if he feels like right. that. Second, as far as Muslims are concerned, as you said, that uh, that it's Ahmadiyas and not why only Ahmadiyas. There are Shias, there are Bohras, there are. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's fine. So nobody is stopping them from taking uh, citizenship of India. Nobody is stopping them from taking asylum in India. They can apply for that through the uh, Citizenship Act which has a process of that you have to have uh, be uh, uh, there is a process in which you have to be naturalized resident of this but country why, for about why 11 does it have years. to be that you said in the citizenship amendment i do not know but i heard and the people say that and uh, i have not read it and uh, you are on, on the ground in india why say except muslims why not say including anyone i just made the point about the christians uh, uh, this country can stand up today and say you know what we're going to welcome all the Christians, no Hindus. Are you going to take all of them? So why why is it controversial things? And I don't really know what's going on with the Supreme Court. But that, that has fuel protests and frust frustrations. And it's diverting the attentions of India to be the largest democracy, to be the place where we can invest money and we can build prosperity for our children. And how do you tell a young Muslim or any boy who lives in a slum who cannot drink the water because it's a contaminated, who cannot breathe the air because it's a toxic and unhealthy, who have no hope, who have no job. How do you tell them that this is a great bill for them? And how do you tell the Muslims in India that you do have a place in BJP-led government? I know you're not a BJP spokesperson, but you subscribe to the ideology and their ideals. It's very uh, troubling. See, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see. There has been a lot of misinformation campaign on this thing. I would just like, uh, I will, I'll just try to clarify certain things and uh, put them in perspective. See, one, this, uh, these things have got nothing to do with Muslims in India. One, second thing is uh, that uh, there are already about more than well, fifteen is, million. Well, how do you tell a Muslim? I, I'm a minority. I was a minority in India. I'm a minority in the United States. I fear hostility and prejudice. I couldn't drink the water from the same well. So I understand and the, the discrimination and hostility they face. And the soccer committee made it very clear that they, they're not part of the, there's not a single Muslim member of the cabinet in India except the minority affairs minister. India, Canada, which is a good friend of mine, Pierre, Mr. Trudeau, Justin Trudeau is the prime minister, has a more sick and a minority that India has in his own cabinet. So how do you tell, I, I mean, it's a very clear, it's very clear as I see it and as, as a foreigner that uh, this is not a sustainable thing to do. It is it, a divisive, it's a polarized. No, it's, 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 well, it has been, uh, you know, projected as that thing. One is that there is no discrimination largely in India that uh, Muslims cannot drink from the same well or from the same. Well, yeah, I couldn't, uh, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I couldn't. Yeah, but that is, not the case. that is not the case now. And we also have problems. And why, why only Muslim? Actually, uh, within uh, Hinduism also, you know, Dalit. we have had yes. this past related issues and uh, these issues are still there. And of course, we accept that and we need to work on that. That's not, but Muslims are not discriminated on the basis of uh, that, okay, if they are Muslims, so they cannot drink from the, I have been born and brought up in uh, Delhi. I've been traveling throughout the country uh, for the last two, two and a half decades as a journalist also. So uh, in a large country like India, these are, there are such uh, some incidents, but not with Muslims. They have largely basically happened within what you call the uh, some of the castes uh, within Hinduism. One second is uh, this. See, right now India has is is going through 
a stage where there is a battle of narratives which is going on. So what is it called? Every opportunity. Yeah, there is a battle of narratives, and the narrative battle of narratives is oh, as I explained. Yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's the it's idea of India. Yes. Yeah. Second is you no. Know, this very important thing. I I as far as the viewpoint which I represent, the ideology to which I adhere, we do not see India as divided between the majority and the minority. For us, see, ninety nine percent of the Muslims. Uh, in india they were largely converted 3 to 4 generations ago or probably 5 or 6 generations ago but largely Doesn't all matter. of them otherwise are the same society so we do not look at it like okay that if he has become a muslim his way of worship might have changed but he still remains as much indian or in fact i would say as much hindu as uh, he was uh, earlier so we do not look at it but the opposition because you know bjp and rss so there were certain stereotypes which were cultivated over a period of time because uh, and you know it's very unfortunate that in india we were not able to develop a very progressive muslim leadership muslims are in fact more fragmented uh, than ever and we do not have credible muslim leadership so that vacuum has been exploited by certain political parties and they have been uh, what you call the bjp has always said and the rss also that there has been policy of appeasement but mind you the policy of appeasement for it has it has actually been detrimental to and as you mentioned uh, to muslims and as you mentioned rightly such a committee report said uh, see there were non bjp governments for almost like 50 55 years so if they were very balanced or this thing why didn't muslims in our country progress as much as they should have been uh, as they should have so it's very clear that and now this government see all the schemes which they have launched whether it is ujjwala scheme providing gas connection whether it is providing houses uh, prime minister modi also himself said did they discriminate that okay if he is a muslim he will not get the free house if he or she is a muslim so they will not get the gas connection no no such discrimination has been done in fact they have been benefited immensely so i i would say that if we stop looking at this government from a particular stereotype perspective so things would be much more clearer so let me our own india has a major problem in terms of the healthcare in terms of the climate change unemployment jobs and security and safety of the minorities and muslims india has a uh, uh, india's economy is in tank india's foreign and foreign direct investment is not going uh, they're not going they just withdrew 4.4 billion dollar in this uh, this last year isn't that the time to work together to help shape a better future together rather than talking about uh, uh, about the discriminations the hostility whether they have they can get a gas or not it, it, and that's uh, the religious religious uh, our in our country we welcome people to 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 be to come to this our shore because of the religious prosecutions and inclusive economic mobility and and united states has prospered obviously it has the largest resources in the world it's a very powerful country but it is because we provided them the freedom of press and freedom of religion and they should be and that's what the hindus have in this country you say google ceo is it Indian? Microsoft, do you think they will get the, a Muslim will get the opportunity? Anybody will get that opportunity? India, probably not. So we have to examine our own behavior is how rather than talking about that's my take. That's my view. Rather than talking about the oppositions, that's a, that does not that brings the polarize and polarization is weakens the democracy that brings the divisiveness. We got to figure out how to unify people together. And that's something uh, that we all have to do. So, as you know, there are a lot of things that binds together Muslims and Hindus because the fact that bonds are stronger than the differences that too often drive them apart. Right? And so, tell me a little bit about uh, do you think that so you said it very eloquently this, that India does not have a bias against the Muslims or minorities of Dalit, right? You said that they're not. The BJP is not at war with the Muslim, which is true, which is what you're saying, correct? Which is a wonderful thing to do. So 
I want to change the subject to talk a little bit about some other things about the international media. We talked about it, right? The isolation and the humiliations of your foreign minister. He did not want to go and talk to the Foreign Relations Committee chairman, who's a good friend of Elliot Engel, who lives next door to me, because the, you have to face it. If you don't have anything to hide in Kashmir or anything else, you got to go have it civil discussions. One of the quality of the leader is humility, civility, and kindness. So India has taken a huge beating in the international media. How do you propose to correct this perception that, that makes the India it remains an attractive place for foreign direct investment as India leads a lot of money, close to a trillion dollars to build its infrastructure. I go to Aligarh from Delhi and I couldn't find a place for a restroom to wash my head. <laughs> Isn't this something that, uh, that is the basic necessity of the people's life? You live in, in Delhi, you are probably belong to elite family, so you cannot see through the eyes of the people who are poor, right? So tell us a little bit about uh, what, uh, what needs to be done in this regard. See, one uh, that I don't family, I That's to okay. middle class family. <laughs> I, 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 I in and I, uh, I, I studied in a government university. But uh, of course, uh, I still would say that people like us who live in cities, they are much more privileged than people who live in you know remote areas and they don't have access to some of the basic facilities. Yes, of course, that's a challenge which uh, every government has been facing. And uh, because, see, one of the key issues is that India is a country of uh, almost now 1.3, 1.4 billion people. So to uh, make things happen, and then we have had, you know, the colonial, uh, uh, um, uh, what you call the legacy also, or I would say the excess baggage which we were carrying. So uh, I think the first, say, about 30, 40 years, and I would appreciate uh, it's that uh, not that Congress didn't do a good job. They they built some very good institutions and at the institutional mechanisms, which was uh, very much necessary and which has stabilized Indian democracy. So uh, one is that. Second is that I think as far as isolation uh, in for foreign media is concerned, or isolation in uh, uh, what you call the glow on the global stage is concerned. See, when it comes to foreign media, we have been interacting with foreign media representatives here also. Unfortunately, there are certain stereotypes, as I said earlier also, which have been propagated that, okay, BJP supports a militant Hindu philosophy. and uh, with, But it will take some time you know, to uh, correct that perception. But of course, I agree with you on one point that I think the, this government should have done more in terms of communicating its intent and what it wants to do and how it wants to do. I think the communication strategy of the government needs to be more robust so that uh, unnecessary apprehensions are not created. So I would suggest that if this uh, on our uh, at our level, we have uh, kind of been interacting with uh, the foreign media. We have also put up a website where all the facts about CAA and NRC are there. And uh, with the original documents, it's called cab.getfacts.in. Uh, but I think at, at the level of the government, they need to do more. And I hope that over a period of time, this perception will be corrected. Because exactly, you know, in Indian media also, the, there used to be a stereotype image of BJP and uh, sometimes RSS also. But over a period of time, when uh, we were able to communicate to them, and we were able to show them, OK, what we really are. So that perception got corrected so much so that today people feel that, OK, the whole of media is controlled by us. So well, though that is not the case. But a role in, in India, there is an my... absolute freedom of expression. I, I, uh, see, my... friend, yeah, I, I just want to make my one, because you sure. also talked about freedom of expression. See, there are so many the websites press, which are Pardon? Freedom of press also. Freedom of press, you can also, and human right violation, the three pillars of democracy. Can you shed some light on it? Go yeah, ahead. see, freedom of press, as far as freedom of press is concerned, I think India has got absolute freedom of press. There are so many websites, there are so many newspapers which are running and which are totally anti BJP, which are totally slamming BJP uh, government left, right, and center. But there has been 
they but they are publishing their newspapers there is no pressure on them nobody has been put behind the bar for that no action has been taken no advertisements have been cut for them as far as the government is concerned so one is that and uh, the second thing as far as the human right violations are concerned see we do not agree with the uh, basic concept of human rights as defined by the western framework we have so what our is your own concept what is See, your definition? our concept of human rights is uh, our, i'll tell you i i'll uh, as far as i know uh, whatever little i know our concept of human rights is that we need to consider our duties first and rights later so if yeah, everybody considers right. yeah, yeah that, i'm saying that is everybody a, that is basically putting your own personal agenda on the top of the human right and i want to talk about freedom of press i know and i, I I do not know, but I've seen in the press that that there are several uh, uh, what I, Times of India and Hindu, many many other, and I can tell per personal uh, personal thing that if I write a I, you know I, I write a column every month, you've seen it, right? Yes, Correct. Yes, of in course. Hindustan Times and Times of India, and also write it for Tarun. And I must tell you, is it very disturbing, alarming that they if it is a critical of the government they will not publish it and and you talk about the uh, as you probably know that the uh, indian government uh, puts an ad in some of these newspapers so so there is a stream of revenue for the indian papers and if they write anything which is a critical and you can help to do that you can help to tell them this is a something unacceptable in a democracy we do not want to become a dictator society which is what china is despite the fact that china's economy is the best in the world obviously they are second uh largest uh, which i call economy in the world but i do not subscribe to the dictatorship i like the democracy and democracy have its own challenges they and going back to the some of the newspapers the the is 15 to 20 percent of the revenue they derive from the government they're basically saying that they're taking it out because they're critical of the uh, government and and uh, i just heard and i saw the uh, you know, rather than bringing the people together, and I, I have nothing to, I know I met uh, Prime Minister Modi many times when I traveled with President Obama. I met him after that. He's a great guy. But talking about Pakistan, it's not going to get anywhere. Okay, let's let's figure out how we work together. So, and you are in a great position to basically work with them. You know, they're not going to listen to you all the time, but they, if they listen a little bit, it could make a difference. Right. So, is there anything, so, uh, our own that you want to tell to the audience uh, because you're doing a great job you have you uh, uh, and uh, to the audience to make them feel that we are in this together see i just want to tell the audience that the basic hindu philosophy uh, believes in tolerance and coexistence and that's why right from parsis to jews to christians everybody who came to india was assimilated within the society India India has been one country or uh, Hindu society has been one society which has never attacked any other country uh, as far as the ancient India and medieval time is concerned. I'm not talking about the Mughals. But currently, of course, I think there is churning which is going on within the society. And uh, there is a battle of narratives, as I said, about the idea of India. And I think the essence of democracy is that we can agree to disagree. I would only request that uh, you look at the real facts and figures and there's a certain propaganda also which goes. But kindly look at the facts and figures and not the narratives as they are told by a certain section of people who respect that also. I'm not saying that. But let the dialogue be there. Let this battle of narratives be there and uh, let the cacophony comes down a little bit and let there be more saner voices more rational voices and last thing is uh, but i i think the most important thing in india right now is that we need a very very robust and progressive muslim leadership because until and unless that happens you know this divide is going to widen further and it is detrimental for the whole society as well as the country so to answer, very well said, Arun, you articulated your thoughts in a very effective manner uh, and about the Muslim, uh, I mean, they do have their own battles. 
it took a long time to build that kind of society in America. We're still experimenting our democracy after 220 years in America. So it is the responsibility of the majority, which you and other helps them to understand that we need a, not necessarily a progressive, we need a leadership in the Muslims and the minority and Dalit community to bring people together. Your points are very well taken. They are, they are fractured, they're divided. They have their own personal agenda, uh, which is no different than anybody else, but that is not gonna make people to get, bring people together. And together, uh, diversity, we should be able to embrace them and celebrate them because the religious diversity brings people together, makes us stronger. And when you're stronger, you can help shape a better future for India. Do you have anything else to say before we close our conversation? Mm -hmm. And I wanna- I just okay. want to thank you uh, uh, for inviting me and for letting me share my views. And I'm sure that uh, uh, this is in the true spirit of you no know, healthy dialogue. So it was a privilege and it was a wonderful experience to be here. Thank you so much. You're most welcome, Arun, and thank you for watching the show. And this is Frank Islam wishing you a great week.